of fun for me because Kathy and I have started about the same time, and so she kind of went through the same thing. She did the corporate America. Yep. She's actually in sales, so she logged a lot of frequent flyer miles all over her and a lot of hours for not a lot of money. And so after doing her thing and learning a little bit from Ron, she went on to develop a very serious direct mail campaign. First, if you're not getting motivated sellers into your life, you're not making any money. So, you know, I asked Kathy to come in and do three and a half hours with you this morning so that you really understand how powerful a direct mail campaign can be. And when you think about Paul, he did 104 houses last year. You know, most of it's because of the fact that he's got a big direct mail campaign that's easy to do, and it pulls in a lot of folks. And Kathy is the best there is in the country at direct mail. Her headlines pull better than anybody else's I've ever seen. And so I want you to realize who's with you this morning. Why don't you give her one of those multi-millionaire welcomes and then sharpen up your pencil. Thank you. Good to see you, guys. It is wonderful to be here. I see just a few familiar faces. That's absolutely awesome. Sharpen your pencils up, too. We always have some new stuff to share. What we're going to be talking about this morning is how to find you more motivated sellers than you can handle no matter what your market is doing. Is that okay with everybody? Now these are going to be highly qualified motivated sellers. And then what we're also going to do is we are going to teach you how to automate all of your systems so that you get to deal with nothing but the deals. Is that okay with everybody? All right, terrific. How many folks have never heard me speak before? Most of you. Wow, this is a brand new room for me then. So let me start off by telling you just a little bit about myself and how I got started in this business. I got started back in 1999. And prior to that, I had done the whole corporate America thing. And my last 10 years were in sales. And I was working for a barter company, putting trades together between corporations. Decent money, decent job. I was never home, and I was putting about 100,000 miles a year on my vehicle. Does anybody have any idea what that does to a vehicle? At the same point in time, my husband was working for a national food distribution company, and he worked in what they called the freezer section. Now, I don't care how many big bulky suits they give you, your body can only sustain below zero temperatures for so long. And the man was sick more than he was well. We knew that there had to be something else better out there for us. We had no idea what that better thing was going to be. And in my particular case at that, to at that time, this became particularly poignant for me because my father worked for Lockheed Martin for many, many years. He retired. They did the whole thing with the retirement party and the whole nine yards. That was on Friday afternoon. Saturday morning, he went to the gas station to get gas for his lawnmower, had a heart attack, and died. So who said we got to wait till 65 to retire? Not me, not in my world. And so my husband and I knew that there had to be something better out there for us. We just had no idea what that better thing was going to be. And one night, I was up late watching one of those late-night infomercials on how to buy houses with no money down. I thought, yeah, man, wouldn't that be cool if that really worked? And so at this point in time, I was lucky enough that one of my customers happened to be the person who ran our local real estate club in Tampa, Florida. I am from here in Florida. I'm from the West Coast. It was a two-hour drive last night. This is the best event I've been to in a long time. No airplanes, nothing. So anyway, um, I called him on the phone and I said, hey, what do you think about this real estate investing stuff? Does it really work? And he said, of course it does. You need to come to one of our meetings and make that determination for yourself. And so we started going to some meetings and we started going to some seminars and we started buying some books and tapes and programs and we started putting them on the shelf, putting them on the shelf, putting them on the shelf, and never to be seen again. How many of you have been to that seminar? Well, after about a year, we had spent over 13000 on books, tapes, and programs, and we'd done absolutely zip. And at this point in time, I'm getting mad, because I'm cheap, and I'm getting mad. And I said to my husband, we're going to buy one darn house, because I want my money back. 
And so what we ended up doing, you know, thought we'd have learned something. We start driving the barrel around looking at for sale by owners, and we start getting on the phone calling unclassified ads. Let me tell you how much fun that wasn't. But we ended up buying our very first real estate property, and it was the rehabber from Hades. How many of you have been to that seminar? How many folks in this room are from Florida? Okay, so you guys will really be able to relate. Here in Florida, we have termites. And the only thing keeping the walls up were the termites holding hands. <laughs> and we have these great big natural skylights in the ceiling, so it rained in the living room. And this house was up on piers, so it had those fun house floors. And we were using a hard money lender to fund this deal. And the hard money lender wanted to come out and see the property before he gave us the money. And with him, he brought this great big marble. And for every 12 inches that marble rolled, a thousand bucks came off my loan. And we ended up doing that property anyway. We worked our jobs all day. We rehabbed all night. It took us seven months to finish that first property. Now, I have to tell you that my husband was like Mr. Negative. He didn't want anything to do with real estate at all. In fact, I, I then brought him kicking and screaming to the first seminar that we ever went to, which was on his birthday weekend. And so we ended up rehabbing this thing ourselves. I will tell you right now that if your marriage can survive a rehabber, it can survive anything. So seven months later, we're all done. Got the lease option signed in the yard. We're ready to rock. My husband's over at the house at 11.30 one night with one of his buddies from work. We're going to finish up the uh, plumbing in the bathroom, you know, all the faucets and the, you know, the cool stuff, and we're done. He calls me at 11.30 that night, and he said, Honey, I don't know what's going on, but don't come over here. We're fine. But there are police cars, helicopters, and ambulances everywhere. Let me tell you that there is nothing more exciting than seeing your very first real estate deal on the news the next morning. What had happened was the neighbors on either side of us got into a discrepancy of opinion over a laser pointer. One of the neighbors went into the house, got a shotgun, and shot seven of his neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> so at this point in time, my husband's like, I told you, now we're going to have to sell our house, move into this one, because ain't nobody going to buy it. Well, what had happened was, since this had been in the newspapers, since this had been on the TV news, all these people are driving by this property to see where this had taken place. And all of a sudden, our telephone's ringing off the hook with people interested in our lease option. So I have a new exit strategy for you. <laughs> Anytime we have difficulty selling a property, we're simply going to arrange an incident. <laughs> Seriously, though, we knew that this was not the way that we wanted to buy real estate. We had already been taught that if you could get the motivated sellers contacting you first, that you were much more likely to make a better deal. And so what we started doing was we started playing around with these direct mail campaigns. And, you know, we started kind of niching and going after specific kinds of people that we thought were much more likely to, to want to sell to us. And all of a sudden, our second seller calls us. And he says, hey, Kathy, I just got your letter. I've got a house I need to sell. I've got the deed sitting right here. I'll deed it to you. I've got the keys, too. Is this the kind of motivated seller you want to deal with? Absolutely. Well, nothing is happening. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Let's back up a little bit. There we are. It was a $337,000 rehabber. Property was worth $337,000. Had needed about twenty five thousand to thirty thirty thousand in repairs, and the seller simply deeded us the property for his mortgage balance of one hundred and ninety seven thousand dollars. That's a little more like what we had in mind. 
Well, at this point in time, we decided that we were not doing the rehab. We pretty much had it. So what we did do was we hired a lawn maintenance company. This was six acres, and all six acres looked just like that. We lovingly call this one our haunted house. And so we hired a, a, a lawn maintenance company. They came out. They cleaned it up. They brought the bush hogs. They got it mowed. They pulled out the dead trees. They put in, like, you know, like brick pathways and nice plants in the front. Got it looking really pretty. We hired a cleaning company who came in and cleaned this 4,500-square-foot house top to bottom. It had hardwood floors, hardwood stairways, hardwood uh, mantles around the fireplaces. Beautiful, beautiful home, or had the potential to be a beautiful home. And what we ended up doing was we ended up using an exit strategy that we had learned called a round-robin auction to sell this house. And I'll give you the short version of what a round-robin auction is. A round-robin auction is where you pick the day you're going to sell your house. You have an open house for like two or three hours, very short period of time, in order to create a buyer's frenzy. The more people show up, the more of a frenzy you create. They leave an initial bid on the property, and at the end of the day, you start calling them one by one. They raise their bid, 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 they bought the house. So that's the really short version of what a round-robin auction is. We showed this house 54 times in three and a half hours, and we ended up selling the property for $275,000 without doing any rehab at all. Yes! And when we ended up, everything was said and done, we walked away with a check for $51,000. That's a little bit more like what I had in mind. Well, at this point in time, I've got one of those bosses who's teasing me relentlessly. You know how you'll have negative people in your life? He was one of them. And he was saying things like, have you bought anything yet? Hmm? Have you sold anything yet? Hmm? My favorite was, you can continue to do this real estate business as long as it doesn't interfere with your job. Or you can relate. I'm commission only. Give me a break. So I took a copy of the check to work the next day. I'm New York, born and bred, so I took that check and I shoved it up his nose. Needless to say, I sort of got fired. He didn't even have the guts to do it to my face. He sends me a fax at 1 o'clock in the morning. Well, 51000 is a lot of money. But when you have 200 teenagers who are eating you out of house and home, and you're accustomed to making a halfway decent living, 51000 doesn't go all that far that fast. And so I very quickly knew that I had to replace my income. And so what I did was I started to do something for my business every single day. And that included really niching and going after specific kinds of sellers that I wanted to be dealing with. You see, one of the things that's delightful about direct mail is you can focus and hone in on exactly the kinds of deals you want to do. Well, all of a sudden, I had more deals coming at me than I could possibly handle on my own, and I couldn't do it by myself anymore. I had more deals and more sellers contacting me, and I just couldn't do it. And so in December of 1999, I called my husband at work one day. He was up on a 35-foot forklift replacing a light bulb in the freezer section when I called him. I actually, in fact, I didn't call him. I paged him because they didn't have, there weren't any phones in the freezer section. I guess they don't work. So anyway, I paged him, and he calls me back a few minutes later. He's like, what's going on? Because I usually don't call him in the middle of the day. And I said, well, I need you to do me a big favor today. And he said, what? I said, quit. <laughs> he said, are you serious? And I said, absolutely. It's costing us more money for you to continue your job, and I can't handle all these leads that are coming in by myself anymore. Well, being a good little Ron LeGrand student, he had remembered something that Ron had told us at one point in time. And so he walked into his boss's office, and he said, boss, I've upped my income, up yours, and he quit. <laughs> and that's how I got started in real estate full time alright so let's talk a little bit about why you should develop a marketing strategy to begin with let's see if we can get this working there we go number one to get an endless supply of motivated sellers contacting you first if you can get an endless supply of motivated sellers contacting you first 
You get to pick and choose the deals you want to do. Number two, to give you an unfair advantage over your competitors. Do I have any Bradenton folks in here today? Cover your ears. <laughs> Here's what's really cool. You get the opportunity to work with sellers your competitors don't know anything about. And so it gives you the opportunity to create a much better win-win solution with that seller. Number three, to buy properties no one knows are for sale, including the sellers. You see, these are sellers who have a variety of problems they need to solve. They just have no idea how to do that until they're contacted by you. And number four, to build a highly profitable income on a very limited budget. This is another unique trait of direct mail. Even if you only have a little bit of money to spend, you're going to get deals coming in. And then as you do more deals, you can start putting the profit from some of those deals back into your marketing, do more, and draw more deals in. But direct mail gives you total control over what it is you're doing at all times. Now, there are five steps to your marketing success. Number one, you've got to pick your target prospects. There are two ways that you can market to find sellers. One is the shotgun approach, and one is a targeted approach. Shotgun approach is where we hand out some business cards, we put out some flyers, maybe we run an ad in the newspaper and put some signs out, and we hope that somebody in that big group of people has a property they need to sell. What I want to teach you how to do today is to reach very highly qualified sellers who are much more likely to want to deal with you. In doing it that way, you make your marketing dollars stretch a whole lot further. Number two, you've got to mail a proven letter. You've got to be mailing something you know works. If you're not mailing a letter that you know works, you're wasting your marketing dollars. Now, how are we going to know what makes a proven letter work? Well, number one, let's tell the seller what it is you want them to do. If you don't tell your seller what you want them to do, they won't do anything at all. They'll just sit on their butts, and they won't do anything at all. Number two, give the seller multiple ways to contact you. This is very, very important. The more ways you give a seller to contact you, the more of them are going to because you're going to be reaching them at their comfort level. So give them a telephone number. Give them an email address. Give them a fax phone number. Give them a snail mail address, a mailing address. The more ways you give them a website address, the more ways you give that seller to contact you, the more of them are going to. I will tell you right now, 90% of the sellers I work with, 90% of the sellers I work with do not pick up a telephone and call me. Is that okay with you guys? They will contact me in every other way I give them first. Why do you think that is? Because I told them to. Okay? I don't want them to call me. I want them to give me all the information that I need, and then I'll determine whether or not there's a deal there to be made. So number three, tell the seller what information you need in order to determine whether or not there's a deal there to be made. So you're not wasting your time or theirs on deals you're never going to do. And number four, ask that seller to go ahead and include some photographs. Now let me tell you about a deal that I've been working on for about the last week and a half or so. The seller responded to a mailing. And he sent a letter back to me, which is pretty typical. And the letter's in a nine and a half by 11, you know those brown clasp envelopes? It was in one of those. I thought, okay, this is interesting. So I open it up and there's a letter in there telling me everything about his property. Awesome. In the envelope, there's a copy of his deed, which I didn't ask him for. In the envelope is a copy of a plat map, which I didn't ask him for. In the envelope are a half a dozen photographs of the property. That was really good. In the envelope, there's another piece of paper with a hand-drawn map with handwritten directions how to get to the property. 
Is this the kind of motivated seller you want to deal with? Okay, I'm just in the beginning of the offer making process on this particular deal, but I will buy that deal. I know I will. The more information they give you, the better the deal you're going to make. All right. Number three, we've got to answer the responses from the sellers. And I know how simplistic that sounds, but I also remember the early days of my business when I hadn't done very many deals yet. Do we have folks who have not done your first deal yet? Just a few. Good. Good. You're in a very, very good place, by the way. So you've got to answer the responses from the sellers. And I know how simple that sounds. But sometimes we get really, really busy and we get really tied up in all kinds of things and Gee, we just don't have the time to do that, or we just procrastinate. You've got to answer the responses from the sellers. Now, one thing that I do that helps me to follow up with sellers very simply is I use a software system to help me do that, and we're going to be talking a lot more about that a little bit later on. Number four, we're going to buy some houses, and number five, we are going to create a system for you that's going to bring you deal after deal after deal after deal. Is that all right with everybody? Terrific. Now, there are 12 particular types of direct mail campaigns and 12 particular types of sellers that I like to deal with. And here's the reason why I did this. You are in a marketplace right now where there are lots and lots of pre-foreclosures, but that's not always going to be the case. Obviously, it has not been the case in the past. And so what I want you to do, and what I'm here to help you to do today, is to create a marketing plan long term that will bring you the types of sellers you need to be working with no matter what your market is doing. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing today. The first one is out-of-state owners. And I'm going to take a second to define that a little bit better because I get students a lot of the time that say, what, you want me to go after sellers that don't even live in my state? That's not what I'm trying to do. What I want you to do is I want you to be finding motivated sellers who have a home in your state, but they live somewhere else most of the time. Okay? That's an out-of-town owner. And the way that you tell that someone is an out-of-town owner is because the tax bill for that property is mailed to an out-of-town address. Now, these are very good leads for a variety of reasons. As a matter of fact, I put a property under contract yesterday uh, that I'm selling that I just bought a couple of months ago. Cash buyer came in. We're closing on May the 30th. I just found this out yesterday, so it made my month, or the end of my month anyway. And my profit on this deal is going to be about $47,000 when everything's said and done. So... Out-of-state owners are really good people to work for. Now, I happen to be, I own an out-of-town property, so believe me when I tell you, I understand all the headaches that go with that, and a lot of people just want to give it up for a lot of different reasons. They retire, they're older, whatever, and they just want to give it up. I will tell you that the out-of-state owner mailing continues to be a highly successful mailing for us. So the other thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you folks step-by-step step exactly how to do this out-of-state owner mailing. Is that okay with everybody? Awesome. Number two, quit claim deeds. What I mean by that are folks who have quit claim this property for a variety of reasons. Now, a quit claim deed is a non-market sale that takes place. Here's a couple of examples. Say you're a gal and you own your own home and you get married. What you're going to do most likely is to go down to the courthouse and quit claim that home into your married name. Or you may add your spouse to that deed. What that tells me is that she owns a home and possibly he owns a home and they may want to sell one or both and buy one of their very own. Now the reason I know this is because that's exactly what I did 18 years ago. Owned my own home, got married for the second time, we ended up going down to the courthouse, put the home in his name, then we sold it and bought one of our own. Okay, So this is another good lead source for you. Here's another thing that happens with quit claim deeds. When a person dies, okay, probate an estate, very, very good leads for you. When a person dies, generally the home is quit claimed to a personal representative, executor, executrix, whoever the person handling that estate might be. 
And I will tell you right now that nationally, on a national basis, 25% of total pre-foreclosures are estate and probate properties. The other thing I will tell you, because we'll talk about that in a little bit, is that there are ways that you can find these sellers that nobody else knows about, even if they're in pre-foreclosure. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Number three, farming areas by zip code. What I mean by that is going after specific zip code areas where you might want to buy properties. For example, you can go after these bread and butter neighborhoods. These are large market areas where people want to live, and there are a large number of homes generally for sale. You can also focus on specific zip code ranges where there are luxury properties. Luxury properties, bigger paychecks. Okay, so you can focus this using some other parameters, but you can go after specific types of sellers in these zip code ranges. Number four, multifamily owners. What I mean by that are the small and large apartment complexes. And this is a list that you can customize in a variety of different ways to bring you exactly what you're looking for. So, for example, if you're looking for a building that has 1 to 10 units, 10 to 20 units, 20 to 30 units, whatever you're looking for, you can customize these lists to bring you exactly what it is you're looking for. And we'll be talking a lot more about list brokers in a little while. Number five, hard to find sellers. This is where you're going to find those vacant properties. How many folks in the room are actively looking for vacant properties? Anybody? Good. If you have not been looking for vacant properties now more than any other time in history, is an ideal time for you to be looking for vacant houses. They're sitting vacant for a variety of reasons, and one of the primary reasons right now is pre-foreclosure. Another is estate situations. They don't know what to do about it, so they don't do anything. Landlords that are sick and tired of having tenants tear up their property, so they just leave them empty. I will tell you right now, the more difficult it is for you to find the seller, the better a deal you're going to make. And I actually have 18 different ways that I use to find the owners of vacant properties. Now, there is one way that I use to find vacant properties when everything else fails me, including using a, script, a skip tracer, which works almost every single time. Would you guys like to take a few, just a minute or two to, for me to, t to share with you how to find the owner of vacant properties? Okay. So nice to have more time. Here's what you do. You take your sign that says for sale by owner with your phone number and you put it in their yard. I'm not joking, by the way. This is serious. The response will be quick and it won't be pretty. And when the person calls and starts yelling at you, what you're going to say to them is simply this. Oh, you know, what, what are you talking about? Your sign is in my yard. What do you think you're doing? Oh, man, I really appreciate your calling. And you totally, you know, the person's like, what? Well, you know, the kids have been moving my signs around again, and those things cost like 15 bucks a piece. Can you tell me where it is? Okay, and they'll tell you the address of the property, which you only have. You just got their phone number on caller ID. You go over to the property. You remove their sign. Oh, you remove your sign, you call them on the feet, you know, and then you see, that obviously, the property is vacant and empty. That's why you did it in the first place. You call them back the next day, and you say, you know, I went over there, and I took my sign out of your yard, but I noticed that your property is vacant and empty. Are you interested in selling? I can't tell you how many properties I bought this way, guys, for real. <laughs> I had a student two months ago who came up to me at an event. She's, in, like, in her 20s. And she goes, you know that thing you told us about the vacant properties? I thought you were kidding. But you know, there was this house that I'd been looking for the owner forever. And I thought, you know, what the heck? And I went over there and I put my sign in their yard. And you were right. The lady called me and she was screaming at me. And I didn't know what to do. So I told her the truth. I told her you said to do it. <laughs> Swear to you, when everything else fails, that absolutely works. All right. 
Just wanted to share. Number six, pre-foreclosures. How many folks in the room are actively working pre-foreclosures? I knew that would get me a lot of hands. All right. How many folks are interested in finding pre-foreclosures that there's absolutely no competition for whatsoever? These are the pre-foreclosures I like. These are your estate and probate properties that you will be finding from your out-of-state owner mailing and your quick-to-claim deed mailing. So they're going to fall in your lap accidentally. Here's what happens. Generally speaking, at this point in time, when a person dies, the mortgage company does not initially find, um, I'm sorry, initially file a list pendants or a notice of default because they know their borrower is dead. Property now goes to probate or it goes to an heir who inherits this property. Property is two, three, four months behind on a mortgage on a house that the person neither wants nor, need, nor, nor needs with a mortgage that is not in their name. How many folks think these are ideal situations for a short sale, yes or yes? And the mortgage companies are more than willing to work with you because they know their borrower is dead. I have bought many properties using this technique because none of your competitors know anything about these properties. Because so far, this penance or notice of default has not been filed. Is that pretty cool? Yes? All right. That's what we're here to learn. Expired listings. How many folks are actively working with a realtor in your business? Not nearly enough. If you folks are not working with a realtor in your business, now is absolutely, once again, the time to be working with a realtor in your business for a variety of reasons. One of those, again, is pre-foreclosure. Because you will be able to get good leads from your realtor or folks in pre-foreclosure who have these loans that they simply want to walk away from. But let me tell you some of the other things that your realtor should be doing for you. Do we have realtors in the room today? Wow, a whole bunch of you. Here's your shameless, um, uh, your shameless plug, realtors. Here are the things your realtor should be doing for you. They should be bringing you MLS listings with keywords in them. Seller motivated, pre-foreclosure, estate, handyman special, needs TLC. Let me tell you about one I just bought. This realtor thought they were being really brilliant. And in the listing, they put fire sale. The house hadn't burned. They were just trying to sell it quickly. But nobody else knew that except me. I bought that puppy. Okay. So these are some of the things your realtor should be doing for you. The other thing your realtor should be doing for you is bringing you old MLS listings. Almost expired, not quite. These are the sellers who are sick and tired of having people trounce through their property weekend after weekend after weekend, and they are much more highly motivated to sell their properties. Right. The other thing that my, that my realtor does is he will bring me properties that he can't list. Too close to the pre-foreclosure date. There's no equity in the property and they can't afford to pay his commissions. Things like that. And he will bring me those types of deals. The other thing your realtor should be doing for you is to be providing you with the expired listings. Let me sh share with you a little deal that I did here in Florida that came from an expired listing. Here it is. This is a three-story house. For you, those of you who don't live in Florida, we don't have basements here. This is a true three-story house. The house is 13,000 square feet, six bedrooms, 11 bathrooms, ladies, two and a half kitchens, guys, two-story game room, nice game room, um, swimming pool, jacuzzi, Sauna, steam room, weight room, tanning salon, whole nine yards. House has got everything. The house belonged to a, long story short, the house belonged to a fairly well-known pitcher for a baseball team. Shoulder injury, career over. Unfortunately, and he was a really, really nice guy. Unfortunately, though, he hadn't saved any money at all during his career. And he was unable to continue making the payments. The house appraised for $1.2 million. 
and it needed about sixty to seventy thousand dollars in rehab, which he also was unable to afford. Now, an end user is not buying a million dollar house that needs sixty thousand in rehab, and so this guy was stuck. The house had been on the market with a realtor for eighteen months, had not sold. We ended up buying this property for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We did seventy thousand dollars of rehab to this property. Let me tell you a little bit about the rehab. In the, it had a huge family room, beautiful, beautiful family room. Corner had had a big old fireplace, stone fireplace in the corner. Had a big screen TV on the wall, which came with the house, by the way. Full stereo system, whole nine yards. Had a whole like a big bar that went across the back of the room with six seats, and you walked into the room and the floor went squish, 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 squish. Beer, beer. Do you know what beer smells like after eighteen months? Cash. It smells like cash. We did seventy thousand dollars of rehab to this property. I fell in love. The builder that built this house, this house is four blocks from where I live. The builder that built this house built the house that I that I live in now. My house would go in this one twice. We came that close to moving in. I even called up Ron Legrand one day and I said, "You know, what do you think we should do?" And he goes, "Well, you could screw up one if you want to move in." But we decided, all in all, that the, the likelihood of this paycheck was just too big, and we didn't want our kids moving back home. <laughs> and it's just my husband and myself and three little kitties, so you know, it's too much hassle. So we put it back on the market, and we ended up retailing this house for a million dollars cash. We walked away from that closing with almost one hundred and ninety thousand dollars. If you guys are not working with a realtor in your business, you absolutely need to because there is a gold mine in expired listings. All right. Number eight, military transfers. Do we have folks in the room who live near a military base? Anybody? Wonderful. Would you folks like to take a minute to learn how to really build your real estate investing business? Do lots of deals. And do a public service at the same time. Yes, this is killer, guys. I found out about this totally accidentally when my son was in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. We brought the kids a rolling baby shower because they were pregnant with our first grandchild at the time, and we brought the big truck that had the wee boy houses all over it because it was the only one they had the crib and I mean everything. So. We, so my son takes us out on the base, and we're driving around on base, and you know it's like that's the commissary, and that's where we shoot the guns and all that good stuff. And so we end up, we get home, and there's like two messages on the answering machine from fellows who had seen our truck on base. So we turn right back around, and we drove back to North Carolina. That will teach you not to check your answering machine when you're gone. So we literally we turn right back around, we drive back to North Carolina. Here's what happens. The military woos these men and women in, and says, "You're going to be stationed here for two years, three years, four years, whatever that is." They use their VA certificate. They purchase a home off base. They pay pretty much full retail. They bring their family. They move all in. They get all comfy, and six months later, they get transferred somewhere else. Now they have a house and a mortgage that they neither want nor need. They can't afford to write a check for realtor fees because they paid full retail for this property. They have very little time to sell it because these transfers take place in a couple of weeks. These are ideal situations for you to simply have these properties deeded to you for the balances of the mortgage. Now, if you get the, the the home deeded to you for the balance of the mortgage, remember they pay pretty much full retail, and there's very little to no equity in these properties. Darn. What you're going to do is you're going to hold these properties longer term to build some equity. Now you could do that two ways: you can either rent them or you can lease option them. Believe me when I tell you, this is one time you really want to rent properties. Ah! No, working with the military is like working with Section Eight on steroids. And here's why. 
The military takes the money for their rent bi-weekly out of their paycheck, and they deposit the money in your checking account once a month for the full amount of the rent. The military sets the rent for you. I like that. Believe it or not, I like that. Here's, here's what we had. The first house we got, 420, four bedrooms, two baths, a beautiful home. We ended up moving my son and his wife into that one. But the military set the rent on that property at 750 bucks. Full stuff. The military takes the money out of their paycheck, deposits it directly in mine there. If the person damages your property, they have to answer to their superior officer, not you. This is killer stuff, guys. The only thing the military does require of you, and they will check your lease, is that you must clause in there, basically saying that if this person is transferred for whatever reason, that you cannot penalize them by withholding security deposit or withholding rent. But the military will turn right back around and help you to find another person to go back into your property. Is this killer stuff or not? Yes? I have properties in Jacksonville, North Carolina that I have not seen in three years. All I see are nice big deposits going into my checking, into my business checking account on the last working day of every month. Now there's a couple of ways that you can find these folks. One is definitely by using these direct mail campaigns. Another is by simply running an ad in the military newspaper on base. And another is to simply put out signs around the base in the area where you want to, uh, where you want to be buying properties. This is absolutely a killer, killer way to grow your real estate business and your public service at the same time. I'll tell you something else. These boys and ladies talk to one another and you will start getting referrals. Okay. We ended up getting more referrals than any ad I ever ran. Okay, because they just keep getting transferred. Okay, it's a lousy thing, but that's what happens. As a matter of fact, one of the stories that was kind of cool was we had one fella that we bought, that we got the house from, kept it as a rental, and um, he got transferred, and he was transferred for two years, and when he came back, he wanted to find out if he could buy his house back because they came back in town and they wanted to stay there. And so when the person's lease was up, he ended up buying his property back, so that was kind of neat too. Number nine, subject twos. This is another direct mail campaign that we do that brings us a high number of folks who are simply willing to deed us their properties. Now, during this, what we do is we go after specific subdivisions that we want to buy in. And right now, with the situation with these adjustable rate mortgages, we are finding more properties using this direct mail campaign than we ever had before. You see, that's what I'm saying to you. You want to have a variety of different types of marketing techniques in place at any given time so that you can flex with whatever your market is doing. What I also tell you is that we usually have between two, three, and four different direct mail campaigns going at any particular time. And I'm going to teach you how to use a software program to help you keep track of everything. It will do all of the work for you because I totally want you to be able to automate your business. Is that all right? All right. Number 10, finding your dream home. This is a direct mail campaign that we use to find the home that we currently live in. When we bought our house, we ended up getting $80,000 in equity, and my husband got the seller to do an additional $4,000 of work to the property before we moved in. Is this a motivated seller? Now, I will also mention to you do me another favor and make a note. Don't ever try to second guess what a seller is thinking because you will never know what their true motivation is sometimes. Sometimes they'll tell you, and that's what happened here. This is a direct mail campaign that you can customize in a variety of different ways by number of bedrooms, by number of baths, by size of the property, whether or not it's got a swimming pool or that kind of thing, what neighborhood it's in, what subdivisions it's in, how many square feet you want. So you can really customize this one to bring you whatever it is you're looking for for yourself. However, this is also a really good direct mail campaign to bring you luxury properties as well. Now, when we went to see the home that we lived in, seller had called us, we made an appointment, 
is a husband and wife, five kids, and her mom. They live with them. Two of the boys were going off to college. When we went to see the property, it was the husband, the wife, and her mom. And we walked into the house. And you know how when you walk into a house sometimes and it just hits you? This is the one. This is the one. You know that feeling? Don't tell yourself. So we walk in and it's like, you know, my husband and I have this like little code thing. And it's like, yeah, this is the one. And so we're walking around and we're looking at it. And I'm trying to get that rapport going with the seller. And I was like, oh, what a lovely home. My goodness, why in the world would you want to sell? It's such a pretty house. And the husband pipes out with, if I don't get rid of my mother-in-law, I'm going to scream. And she's standing right there and he's dead serious. We changed the subject really fast. When they were moving out of that house, it was unbelievable because, you know, we had, there was other work that was being done. We had a termite tenant and all that stuff before we moved in. And the husband and three of the boys did all the packing. She went and rented a motel room on the beach until all the moving was done. They were weird, really, really strange. So don't ever try to second guess anything a seller is thinking. Because, I mean, sometimes they'll tell you, but a lot of times they won't. All right, number 11, the attorney letter. This is a really good way for you guys to find some great leads. Here's what you do. You go into the yellow pages, and you pick out like 30 or 40 different attorneys that you're going to do a direct mail campaign to. You don't want to do a really high number, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And you go into attorneys who are much more likely to bring you deals. So you're going to be looking under the headings of family law, real estate law, marital law, wills and trusts, those types of attorneys. And what you're going to do is you're going to mail out a letter once. A week later, you're going to mail it out again. And a week after that, you're going to follow up with all of the attorneys who have not already contacted you. So that's why you don't want to do like a huge number of these letters because it's very cumbersome if you do. The first time I did this mailing, we ended up creating relationships with four attorneys who today still bring us deals. You see, what happens is if you create a relationship with an attorney and you are a person of integrity, and you do what you say you're going to do, when they have a client come in who needs to to sell a property, no matter what condition it's in, and they need to sell it quickly in order for that attorney to be able to liquidate assets, the attorney's going to call you first. Now, the other thing interesting about working with attorneys is they also talk to each other. Down in Bradenton, we have this little restaurant, if you want to call it that, across the street from the courthouse. It's been there for like a hundred years, like really old, old building. And they have the best greasy burger in the state and the coldest beer anywhere. And this is where all the attorneys congregate at lunchtime. And these attorneys talk to one another and you will end up getting referrals from other attorneys that you didn't know anything about. As a matter of fact, about six or seven months ago, I got a call from an attorney. And he calls me up and he goes, hey, Kathy, my name is Derek, and I'd really like to know why you're not borrowing money from me. Because I don't know you. (laughs) Well, he ended up getting my name as a referral from one of the other attorneys that I work with. And he ended up giving me, as a private lender, a credit line of $2 million, which I'm going through as fast as I can. As a matter of fact, I just paid off a loan to him this last week, and he was furious with me. You're supposed to keep the money out there. I've got two. Oh, by the way, these attorneys will bring you deals. I've bought four deals from that attorney in six months because he can't stand for his money not to be out there being, being busy, so he brings me deals to use his money to buy. Is this the kind of person you want to deal with? Here's the deal. Here's the money. Works for me. You really need to be creating relationships with attorneys. That's a really good way to find deals. Number 12 is another direct mail campaign that I do that brings me a high number of folks who own their properties free and clear without mortgages. And what that means to me is creative financing with the seller. 
So once again, you don't have to go out and hunt, get the money. You've got the money right there because the seller's going to finance the property for you. Now, there is another market out there that none of your competitors are working with because they have absolutely no idea how to do that. And I'm about to ask you the stupidest question that I will ask you here today. How many folks in this room live in an area where there are Spanish-speaking homeowners? Told you that would be the stupidest question I'd ask today. Now, I will tell you that I, I read sort of a sad article yesterday. And this is another reason that we need to be working with these Spanish-speaking homeowners. There are a very high number of Spanish-speaking homeowners who are in pre-foreclosure, just like you know everybody else. However, they don't understand the documentation that they're getting. They don't understand how to contact the lenders to, you know, to, to, work, to try to work something out because it's very difficult for them with the language barriers that, that they have. And so there are a very high number of, of pre-foreclosures in the Spanish-speaking communities. And I just read that article. It was in the paper yesterday morning, and I thought, man, I need to share that with my group tomorrow because that's huge. Now, one of the reasons that none of your competitors are working with the Spanish-speaking market is because they don't speak Spanish, and so they have no idea how to work with the Spanish-speaking market. How many folks would like to take just a few minutes to learn how to, to work with the Spanish-speaking communities, even if you don't speak a single word of Spanish? Anybody? This is one thing that's really great about having extra time. All right. This is so pathetically simple, it's ridiculous. Here's what you do. You mail your letter out, English on one side, Spanish on the other. English on one side, Spanish on the other. So if you're doing pre-foreclosure mailings, the zip code mailer, the quit claim deed mailer, whichever mailer that you're doing, English on one side, Spanish on the other. Now you're mailing the letters out, but you know, gee, where am I going to send them? Because if they call me, I don't speak any Spanish. So what you're going to do is you are going to go to the yellow pages and you are going to look under answering services, bilingual answering services. Now, I know we have Pat live here, and as far as I know, I would absolutely ask them. I didn't have a chance to do that this morning. They, they do. Okay. The last time I spoke to them, they didn't. So they do now? Yes? Okay. Awesome. Then you've got it here. Okay. So you're going to be using a bilingual answering service. And what you're going to do is you are going to provide them with your telephone script, whatever you're using, to get the information that you need from your sellers. And what happens is the bilingual answering service will take the will, will ask the questions of the seller in Spanish. And then they will translate it back for you to English, and then we'll either email or fax them to you on a daily basis. Really simple so far, right? Now we have a response from the seller. Oh man, that's a deal. Oh, I still don't speak any Spanish. What am I gonna do? You're going back to the yellow pages. And you're going to look under interpreters. And the first time I looked under interpreters in the yellow pages, guess what I found? Real estate interpreters. I never knew there was such a thing until I needed one. An, inter an interpreter is going to charge you between $50 and $75 an hour for their time. Very, very negligible. They will meet you in a central location. They will sit down between you and the seller. They will negotiate the deal, whatever you're doing, whether it's you're taking the deed or whether you're, uh, you're buying at retail or using hard money or private money or however you're buying that deal, you know, or arranging a short sale. They will sit down with you and they will work through the negotiations between you and the seller. At that point, you're going to close this property at a title company and virtually every title company in the country has a Spanish-speaking division. So what we're going to do is we mail a letter out, English on one side, Spanish on the other. We send them to a bilingual answering service. When we get the replies and we see that there's a deal there, we work with the interpreter, we negotiate the deal, we take it to the, to the title company. Is this pathetically simple, folks? Absolutely, and none of your competitors know anything about it, and they're not doing it. So if you're not working with Spanish-speaking sellers, this is something you absolutely need to be thinking about doing. 
Now, what I also wanted to do is I wanted to share a couple of deals that we've done and what some of our results have looked like for our direct mail campaigns. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Now, this is a, um, a, a, a deal that I brought, and I brought this deal for a specific reason. This is this deal, some, we did this 18 months ago, and I brought this one because I really wanted to drive home another really important point. And that point is that you must follow up with semi-motivated sellers. You see, the folks we're going to be dealing with, a lot of them have heartstrings attached to these properties for whatever reason. And so when you come in today and you make an offer on that property, and they go, mm, mm, can I think about it? Okay? They're not telling, even if they say, no, I don't like your offer. Okay? Don't get all offended and don't throw the deal in the trash. Because when they, will, when they say no, what they really mean is maybe, just not today, could you give me a couple, three, four months to kind of stew it over? And then could you contact me every single month in the meantime until I make up my mind? That's what they're really saying. I will tell you right now, 60% of the deals I do, 60% of the deals I do come from following up with semi-motivated sellers. They just haven't made up their minds yet. This is another huge point that will make you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars more in this business than your competitors who get their feelings all hurt and crumple it up and throw it in the trash can. Okay? And so I brought this deal, and once again, this, I am also going to teach you how to use this software system that will do all the follow-up for you, so you don't have to do any of it. Is that okay with you guys? Yes? Okay. So I brought this deal, and let me tell you what happened. This was an out-of-state owner. Fellow owned a property in Bradenton, where I live, and he had been transferred to Colorado for business. He's making mortgage payments in Bradenton, rental payment in Colorado. And he calls me on the telephone and he goes, hey, Kathy, I just got your letter. Whoa, man, your timing is awesome. Um, let me tell you, do me a favor, go ahead and call my realtor. You can see the realtor sign in the yard. Go ahead and call my realtor and see if you guys can put together some kind of a deal. And I said, you know, Dan, that's just, that's not a bad idea. But, you know, I just really feel like we could do a better deal if it was just you and me one-on-one. -on -one. I just, you know, I just really feel like we could do a better deal. But would it be okay with you if I just followed up with you periodically to find out whether or not the house sells? Would that be all right? And Dan said, yeah, that's fine. No problem. This was in April. April went by. May went by. June went by. July went by. August went by. September went by. House hasn't sold yet. You think Dan's getting more motivated now? Absolutely. Dan calls me in September and he goes, Kathy, it's getting really cold here in Colorado and I don't have any clothes and my twin girls be putting all my money out to these stupid payments. What do I need to do to make this mortgage payment go away? And I said, the best thing that you can do, Dan, is to deed me that property for the balance of your mortgage. House is worth 240000 drop dead, perfect condition. Dan's mortgage is 192000 he deeds the property to us for the balance of his mortgage. Am I okay? Well, I am not making Dan's payment either. So we turned right around and we immediately lease optioned this property to a tenant buyer. Now I will tell you the story that I am telling you is absolutely true. Sellers are nuttier than you'll ever imagine. So seller gives us a $12,500 non-refundable option deposit. She moves into the property. The seller is a doctor who has just moved her practice to Bradenton, where I live. And so she moves into the property. She calls me on the phone the next month, and she goes, you know, Kathy, this is a beautiful home, and, and it's in a boating community, and I have a boat, but, you know, ultimately, I don't know for sure that this is really where I want to live. Well, I know I'm going to lose my option deposit if I don't exercise my lease option, but is that the only penalty? <laughs> Let me think about that for, like, three seconds. So, house is cash flowing at $350 a month. The buyer, the tenant buyer, puts all new fencing in the property, and this is horrendously expensive because this is a homeowner's association, and it's got to be done like their way. So, we're, and the house is looking beautiful. Really, I should put all new gardens in. House is looking great. Month number 11, my tenant buyer calls me on the phone. Hey, Kathy, guess what? What? We're building a house. Oh, darn we're not going to be able to exercise our lease option. Oh, darn. But you know, here's the problem. 
Our house isn't going to be ready for like three more months. Is there any way we could just extend the lease like three more months? Cash flowing at 350 a month. Let me think about that for about two seconds. Life goes on. Month number 12, December, Dan calls back. Hey, Kathy, what's going on? I don't know, Dan, you tell me. It's freezing in Colorado. There's like three feet of snow on the ground. God, I hate Colorado. I'm coming back home to Florida. Is there any way my house is still available? Well, Dan, I've got a tenant in it until the end of March. How's that grab you? Hmm. Let me think. Let me think. Hmm. I know. I could move in with my sister for a couple of months. How much would it cost me to get my house back? Don't know, Dan, how much you got. <laughs> Soon as you name the number, you screwed yourself. His company paid us $25,000 for the honor of Dan buying Dan's own house. I made over $40,000 on a house I never touched because I took the time to follow up with a semi-motivated seller. Does that make sense? I could show you deal after deal after deal after deal of the same kind of stuff. You've got to be following up with these semi-motivated sellers. Okay? Really, really important to make more money in your business. All right, so let's talk about the out-of-state and mailing results. These are my last, 12 num- my last 12 months. Now, do me a favor. Please do not let my numbers scare you because you can do this in a much smaller way and get really, really great results. We mailed out about 6,000 letters last year to the out-of-state owners, just about 500 letters per month. And on the average, that's just pretty much what we do. It's like a machine. It just kind of runs itself. What I'm also going to do is teach you how to put that whole part of your business into someone else's hands so you don't have to do the direct mail campaigns. Because if you do the direct mail campaigns, you're not paying attention to your sellers. If you're paying attention to your sellers, you're not paying attention to your direct mail campaigns, and your business is going to do this. How do you think I know that? We got 365 leads, about 31 leads per month. That's about a 6, 6.5% response rate from highly qualified, motivated sellers. Is that okay? And we bought 21 of those properties. Total cash, 429000 Total equity, 496 Cash and equity together, 925000 Total cost of mailings, $4,000. Net profit, $920,000. How many folks could use another 920000 in the next 12 months? Now, you will see that my cash and money numbers are fairly close. And the reason for that, for that is because I choose it to be that way. You see, that's one of the other really cool things about direct mail. You can do whatever it is you need to do. For example, if you need money like you need oxygen... You can customize your direct mail campaigns to bring you wholesale deals so we can get cash coming in for you today. If you're the kind of person like Robin who likes to buy them, uh, rehab them, and retail them, you can customize your direct mail campaigns to bring you those types of properties. If you're sort of looking more toward retirement, as I am at this point in time, you can start doing, you can do property management with apartment complexes, you can do owner financing, lease option, you can get monthly payments coming in. And you see, that's where I have done at this point in time. Because to be perfectly honest with you, I really don't need the cash all that much anymore. How many folks would like to be able to see, gee, I really don't need the cash all that much anymore? It's a nice place to be, let me tell you. So what I'm doing, I'm going to be celebrating my 50th birthday in a couple of months, okay? So I'm working toward total and complete retirement. So what I have done is I have created a relationship with Equity Trust Company, and I have my Roth IRAs with them, and we have about seven years. If you folks have not taken care of your Roth IRA, you need to see Equity Trust Company. Well, they are here, and get set up, even if you're not ready to do it today. Because once you reach a certain income level, it's over. And it's very, very cheap to get your Roth IRA started. So you need to get that taken care of while you're here. 
So what I'm starting to do is I'm starting to do more lease options, more owner finance, and that kind of thing, and feeding that into my Roth IRA. You see, direct mail is the only marketing technique out there where you are in total and complete control of your destiny. Whether you want equity, whether you want cash, you can customize it to get exactly what you want. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Final mail is by zip code. This is a zip code mailer that we did. This was kind of a neat little deal. What happened in this particular case was daughter's living in Ohio, mom's living in Florida. And what they're trying to do, house needs rehab, because grandma has lived there like a long time on her, on her own, and she's just not able to really take care of the house well, and daughter's got a difficult time doing it from Ohio, okay? So they're sort of between a rock and a hard place. So they got, they got our letter, grandma got our letter at the property, and because we had sent something really personal looking, she forwards it up to the daughter in Ohio. We ended up putting the deal together, and um, we ended up making about $45,000 on this property, and the daughter got exactly what she wanted, which was getting mom up in Ohio so she could take better care of her up there. Okay, so the zip code mail is another really great way to make some deals. So let's look at the results from the zip code mailer last year. Now, this is a fairly small mailing for us because I'm going, this is a, that was just like a real typical sort of middle class, you know, sort of bread and butter middle class kind of a neighborhood, like right in there, okay? And that's the area that I like to go after because it's a nice big marketplace for me to buy from. So we only do about 200 letters per month on this particular mailer. Once again, it's kind of automatic. It just takes care of itself. We ended up getting 290 leads, about 24 leads per month. That's about a 12% response rate from highly qualified, motivated sellers. Is that okay with everybody? And we ended up buying 18 of those properties. You see, you get to pick and choose the properties you want to buy. Total cash, 491. Total equity, 411. 902, cash and equity. Total cost of mailings, 1800 bucks. Net profit, $900,600. How many folks could use an extra $900,000 in the next 12 months? Are you starting to see a pattern developing here? Yes? Okay. Now, I also brought for you a couple of letters from sellers that I wanted you to see. Just to kind of give you an idea of the type of response I get from my sellers. Because remember, 90% of these sellers do not pick up a telephone and call me. Here's one where the lady told us every single thing about the property since her grandfather built it. The more information you get, the better deal you're going to make. Here's another one. This is Kelly. Hi, my name is Kelly, and I received an interesting letter from you today. Yes, me and my husband are interested in selling, but we want no gains. We've been through a lot with trying to sell this house. You know, realtors. Ah! I didn't like that, folks. She did. We're asking $225,000 for our property, and it's approximately, uh, amount owed is $155,000. She goes on to tell us about the property. Now, the property is worth about $275,000, $280,000. So I already know I'm topside. Please contact us ASAP because we wanted our house sold like yesterday. And if you don't buy it, then we have to go with the realtor as our last resort. Okay? We ended up buying this property for $189,000. Is that okay? Is this the kind of response you want to get from motivated sellers? Yes? Absolutely. Now, well, I told you that I was going to share with you exactly how to get these out-of-state owners to contact you and exactly how to do this out-of-state owner mailing. So if you haven't been taking notes, now's a really good time. Number one, we're going to get a list of targeted prospects. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Number two, we're going to mail to them. Number three, we're going to wait for the response. And number four, we're going to mail to the same list at least every 90 days. Once again, we're going to show you how to completely simplify and automate that entire process. So it's going to be very, very simple for you. All right, so what should be on this list? The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to target single-family homeowners whose property tax bill is mailed to an out-of-state address. Single-family homeowners' uh, tax bill mailed to an out-of-state address. Are 
on this list, you're going to get the sale date of each property. Sale date of each property. And the reason for that is because you're going to mail to the oldest sale dates first. Here's my thinking behind that. You have a seller who bought this vacation home or second home, wherever it is that you live, and they bought this home when they were reaching retirement age. So they're like 45, 50, 55 years old, back in 1975, 1980, 1985. The same person now is 70, 75, 80, 85 years old, and they don't want to come to wherever it is you live anymore for whatever reason. You know, they're elderly, they've moved in with another relative, they, you know, they just can't make the trip anymore, whatever that might be. And these are very, very good deals for you. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to mail to the properties that have had the highest equity spread. The highest equity spread. And the way that you're going to do that is by getting the sale amount and the assessed value of each property. So we have sale date, sale amount, assessed value of each property. Let me show you a real deal to bring that home for you. We were working with a lady recently and she paid 88000 for her home back in 1990. The home is assessed for 284000 and it's worth 325000 Sale date, 1990. Sale amount, 88000 Assessed value, 284000 Is there enough room between 88000 and 284000 for you to construct a good deal? Yes? Absolutely. Okay? So that's why I want you to do that. The next thing I want you to do is I want you to go back to the sale amount column and I want you to mail to every property that's had a quit claim deed. Now, depending on where you live, this is going to show up differently for you on your list. You can check with your, your property appraiser's office, your list broker, whoever that might be to see how it's going to show up for you. But once again, quick claim deed is a non-market sale that takes place. So usually it's $10 or $100. My county down in Manatee County knocks off the zeros, and there's just a one in the sale amount column. In other counties, it will show up as a zero or a blank space because it's a non-market sale that took place. In other counties, it's going to show up as $10 or $100. Okay, you're going to have to check with your list broker or with your county to find out how that's going to show up for you where you live. Now, I know the next question that's burning on your heart is, but Kathy, where do I get the list, right? All right. Told you we'd get there. The first thing that you can do is to contact your local property appraiser's office, assessor's office, auditor's office, whatever that's called where you live. Here in Florida, it's the property appraiser's office. In North Carolina, it's the auditor's office. In other places, it's the assessor's office. Just depends, once again, on where you live. And you're going to ask them to produce this list for you based on the parameters that I just gave you. You see, each one of my direct mail campaigns has parameters just like these. Well, similar. They're, they're all a little bit different so that you can hone in on exactly the kind of seller that you're looking for, but we're still talking about the out-of-state owner mailing. Now, what will happen is some of the counties will give it to you, and some of them won't. Some of them will give you like a whole disc with all of the out-of-state property owners, and then you've got to go in and fix the list and divide it out by the other parameters. Now, one thing I will tell you is you need to go down there and ask them for it. If you call them on the telephone, you're going to get a flunky who makes 8 or $9 an hour, and they don't want to do any other work, and they're going to blow you off. How do you think I know that? Go down and talk to someone who counts, a supervisor. You're going to use this list for a year, so just go ahead and go down and do it. Okay? <laughs> the next thing that you can do is to simply go to the yellow pages, and look under mailing lists. 
And here's one I arbitrarily pulled, and there were nine. The other thing that you can also do is use internet resources. Now, what I have done is I have personally created relationships with six different list brokers who will provide the lists for you exactly the way you need them. They can download them right into your software system so you can get going that way very easily. So I've already created these relationships with these list brokers. So it's very, very simple. Now, there are three keys to your success or failure when you're doing direct mail campaigns. Number one, you've got to target the right prospects. And we just talked about that with regard to the out-of-state owner mailing, or to, with regard to the out-of-state owner mailing. Number two, you've got to get your envelope opened and read. Very important. Otherwise, what was the point of the whole exercise? And number three, you've got to make it easy for the seller to respond to you. Now, I can't tell you how incredibly important this is, so I'm going to give you a real example to bring it home. My mom lives here in Florida. She's 78 years old. Yeah, 78. <laughs> Just had her birthday, so I had to think about that. She's 78 years old. And, of course, here in Florida, we live in the hurricane capital of the world. And so, of course, they canceled her homeowner's policy. She calls me on the phone, and she says... Kathleen! She's the only person in the world that gets away with Kathleen! I know you've got a bunch of properties and I know you've got a bunch of rentals and stuff and they canceled my homeowner's policy and I need the names of those people so I can contact them and, and get some quotes on my homeowner's policy. And so I did. I gave her the name, the addresses, and the phone numbers, you know, to some of the insurance companies that we use. And what do you think she did? No, she did. She took care of it. You would have thought she'd have picked up her phone and called him, right? Is that what you do? Yes? No. She sat and she wrote him all a letter. You know why she did that? Because that's the era she was brought up in. And that's the way these folks do business. And if you don't reach your sellers at their comfort level, you're not going to do the deals. Does that make sense? Okay? Since I had the time, I thought I'd just drive that one home because it's real, real important. I really want you to be really, really successful in your marketing, and I really want you to find these motivated, these highly qualified, motivated sellers and get some deals done. Now, we're going to talk about how to get your envelopes open and read. Now, do me a favor. Do not divert from anything I'm telling you to do here today. I know your natural inclination is to take what I give you and then fix it. This stuff is tested and tracked and tracked and tested, and it works. Number one, use a number 10 business size envelope. I don't know why it works, it just does. We've tested, um, we've tested invitation, we've tested regular size, we've tested window envelopes, we've tested it all colors. Yeah. The best thing that works, postcards go straight in the garbage can, they don't even look at those. The best thing that works is the number 10 business size envelope. Number two, we're going to hand address them, including the return address. We already have someone else who's going to do all of the work for us. Let them do the whole darn thing. Okay. Number three, for the return address, use an address only. Do not put a name in the return address. The curiosity kills them. Who's it from? And they open it up. Number four, use first-class stamps for postage. Do not use bulk rate. Do not use metered mail. Bulk rate, we don't even know if that ever gets delivered. Metered mail, not only does it take five or six days longer to get to them, but they know it's a solicitation and it's going in garbage. And the whole point is to get your envelopes opened and ready. Number five, make sure the handwriting is neat and legible. And number six, make sure the spelling is correct. Very, very important to the success of your mailings. Give you another example. My last name is Kenny Brook, spelled K-E-N-N-E-B-R-O-O-K. -E -E My husband's first name is Jay. I get stuff in the mail all the time, hand addressed to Mrs. Kenny Brook. Do you think I know that's garbage? I'm not opening it. Okay, so show the same respect to your sellers. Make sure everything is spelled correctly. Very important. 
Now, I will tell you that there's one main time of the year that you need to start doing your direct mail campaigns, and that is now, now, and right now. A couple of reasons for that. One is, depending on what part of the country that you're from, any time your tax bills, your property tax bills come out, is one of the times of the year that you really need to beef up what you're doing. And the reason for that, now I know ours don't come out until October, but you need to be gaining your momentum and get to that point. Because what happens is, if you are contacting motivated sellers, and now they just got a property tax bill on a property they don't want and they don't need. In fact, they may not have ever seen it. And now they got a property tax bill for three, four, five, six thousand dollars or more. Do you think they're more motivated now? Absolutely. Another good time of the year to beef up what you're doing is during the holiday season. And here's why. They are opening everything. Because they are hearing from folks, you know, who are writing them letters that they haven't talked to in a year, and they open everything. Now, during the holiday season, I will give you permission to use little stickers on the front of your envelope. Happy holidays, season's greetings. I don't want to see Christmas trees. I don't want to see Merry Christmas. I don't want to see Happy Hanukkah. You don't know who you're, 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 you're working with. So it needs to be happy holiday season's greetings. Very, very neutral. Okay? Just a couple of really, really good points. You really need to get these direct mail campaigns going because I'll tell you what happens is it's a machine. Because what happens is not only do you have deals coming today, but you're constantly sowing seeds for future deals and you just keep having deals that just start coming in. And it's a machine. All right, now I have a telephone script that I use for each one of my direct mail campaigns. And basically what we did was we developed an operating manual for our office with each one of the direct mail campaigns with all of the directions to do each one. And the reason that we did that is you'll see that my husband is not here today, right? He's not here. And I only live two hours away, so it wouldn't be like a big deal. Well, the reason that my husband isn't here today is because he doesn't like people very much. <laughs> He's a back-end kind of guy. He doesn't like people. And you guys would scare him to death. Seriously. So he's the brains and I'm the mouth. That's the way our life works. And the reason that we developed this operating manual is so that I don't have to keep retraining new people as they come in and do direct mail campaigns for us. So what we did was we developed a telephone script for each one of the direct mail campaigns. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that depending on which direct mail campaign you're doing, there are different things that you want to know. For example, if you're working with someone in pre-foreclosure, we want to know how far behind are your payments, have they filed loose payments or notice of default, how much is your mor- or how much, what's the balance of your mortgage, things like that. But if we're working with someone who has a multifamily building, for example, we want to know how many units are there, are they vacant or occupied, are they metered separately, different things like that. So depending on which direct mail campaign you're doing, there are different questions you're going to ask. Does that make sense? So let's take a look at the out-of-state owner one just really quickly. Name of the person on the phone, full name on the deed, full address, asking price, how did you arrive at the price, why are you selling, is there a mortgage, how much is your mortgage, what's your payment, are you willing to own a finance or lease option, does the home need repairs, what kind of repairs, does it have central heat and air, how many bedrooms, how many baths, how soon do you want to move, how soon do you need to close, how did you hear about us, very important because you've got to track your marketing. When can we see the home? Are all the decision-making parties going to be present? If we paid you all cash and close quickly, what's the least you're willing to take? Is that the best you can do? Do you have all the information that you need to determine whether uh, there's a deal there to be made? Now think about this. If you did your direct mail campaign correctly in the first place, you already have most of this information before you ever contact that seller. Are those the kind of sellers you want to work with? Yes? Absolutely. But they're in there just in case you need them. So let's talk about response rates from sequential mailings. These are mine and my students throughout the country for the last 12 months. On the average, first mailings, 8 to 11 percent. I will tell you that right now these numbers are running higher. Second mailings, about 12 to 15 percent. 
third mailing's about 16 to 19 percent. The more you do it, the higher the response rate gets from highly qualified, motivated sellers. Fourth and fifth mailings, 20% or more to the same lists over and over. You see, what happens is when you start contacting these sellers, you're gaining a rapport with them. Okay, wow, he must really care about me. I, he just keeps following up with me. That's so awesome. Wow, these guys must have been in business. They must be in business for a while because, you know, they've been contacting me for like nine months already. You see, you're gaining credibility with these sellers every time you touch them again with a new letter. Okay, does that make sense? Let me show you just some letters from some students throughout the country and just kind of some of the types of response rates that they're getting. This is North Carolina. Now, this fellow made me really mad because he broke every record that I've ever set. He uh, did a pre-foreclosure mailing. He mailed out 15, day, 15 letters and 17 days later had a check in his hand for $10,000. Is that disgusting or what? This is Sarah. Now, I've got to tell you about Sarah before I show you this. Sarah, I remember her. Sarah is an engineer. And she's from Michigan. And when I was done with my session, she came to me in the back of the room and she had this whole notepad of questions. That's how I remember Sarah. Because she was really in an analytical brain, you know? And so she decided that she wanted to try out direct mail. And she was going to give it just a little bitty test, see if it worked or not. So there's her letter. Out of state owner mailings, what she decided to do. She mails out 44 letters, gets three responses, and pulls off two deals. 6.8% response rate. Her numbers. Is that cool? I thought it was neat. This is Chattanooga. This is Tennessee. These folks actually live in Flintstone, Tennessee. They mailed out 101 letters. Got five responses, did one deal, total profit, $35,000, check in hand seven days later, yabba dabba doo. <laughs> Thought that was cool. This is Maryland. Now, this is actually like a out-of-state military, because what happened was she did an out-of-state owner of Maryland, but it ended go up going to someone who was in the military because they owned a home here, and they got transferred out-of-state. So it's sort of an out-of-state owner military. 100 letters. She was intending it to be an out-of-state owner mailing. $40,000 profit on the deal. Are these numbers okay with you guys? Okay. And I'm kind of moving on over the place as far as the numbers because I don't know where your head is at. Some of you can't fathom a big deal, and some of you can't fathom a little deal. So I'm kind of going everywhere to give you a little bit of an example of everything. This is Matt. This was cool. This fellow is 19 years old, 300 letters, his first deal on a subject to mailing, total profit, $48,000. Is that me for 19-year-old young man? I thought that was very cool. Southern California, 1,500 letters, her very first deal on a subject to mailing, $90,000 in equity. This is Florida. 600 letters, 19 responses, four deals, out-of-state owner mailing, $130,000 in profit. Are these numbers okay for you guys? Okay. New York. 35 letters, very first deal on a pre-foreclosure mailing, total profit, $140,000. You guys think direct mail campaigns work? Yes? Just checking. Florida. How to bring a couple from home, you know? Can't help myself. 400 letters, two deals on an absentee owner mailing. This is Miami, Florida, actually. $142,000 in profit. One more. Arizona. Let me tell you a little bit about this fellow before I show you this letter. This is a student turned friend. Very, very nice gentleman. Young man. This boy is so smart, he can't boil water. He has a PhD. He was at my house last July for five days. He can't even boil water in a microwave. Okay? 
But he thought that he would try because he's a very successful real estate investor. He's just so smart. He's just like way out there. Way out there is a good way to describe it. So he's a very, very sweet young man. Very, very nice. So he decides he's going to try out direct mail campaigns in addition to what he's doing with his, with his, uh, with his real estate business. So he mails out 600 letters on an out-of-state owner mailing, gets two deals, and makes a total of $920,000. If this boy can do it, anybody can. <laughs> he's scary. He's so smart. The majority of deals that you're going to buy are going to come from your first through your seventh contact with these sellers. So once again, what I'm saying to you is um, direct mail is one of the very unique types of marketing tools out there for you because not only do you have deals coming at you today, but you are constantly sowing seeds for future deals. And it becomes a machine and you just start getting deals coming in on a continuous basis without you really having to do very much of anything. Is that the way you want to run your real estate business? Yes? I know it's the way I like to run mine. Now, the next thing I want to show you is a letter from a seller after the deal. Now, let's see. What time is it? Is everybody kind of doing okay? Yeah? Okay, because we only got just about like a half hour or so left. Is that all right? Okay, cool. Now, here's a letter that I got from a seller after the deal. To whom it may concern, for the past two years, I have received letters from J&K Properties. Finally, this year, I gave them a call just to see what they were all about. Due to the illness of my husband, I decided to sell J&K. I was impressed by their business-like and friendly manner and would not hesitate to do business with them again. Watch this, folks. How many people in this room are getting a letter like this from every single seller that you're dealing with? None. Not a single body in the room. Zip. This is typically the response that I get when I show this letter. Do you folks want to learn how to steal deals from every competitor in your area? Yes? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to teach you how to build a credibility kit. Take notes. Good time. Now, you're saying, Kathy, what's a credibility kit? Have you ever had a contractor come out to your house? And let's see, he's going to do siding or roofing or cabinets or tile floors, maybe, something like that. And he's got the pretty book that he brings with him. And in the book, there's like copies of his licensing and there's photographs of houses that he's done. And at the end of it, there's either letters or there are referral names and telephone numbers. Have you ever seen those? Yes? Why are we not doing the same thing as real estate investors? Okay? We absolutely should be doing the same thing as real estate investors. This is the tool that you are going to use to work with your sellers and find all of the private lending that you need for your business. So let's talk for a minute about what goes into this credibility kit that you are going to create. The first thing that's going in there is your business card. And you can do this even if you haven't done your first deal yet, folks. You need to start building your credibility kit right now. All right? The next thing that goes in there are copies of ads that you're running. You know, like in the newspaper, your shopper guide or whatever. It's copies of the ads that you're running. These are things that are going to lend credibility for your business. The next thing that goes in there are letters from every seller that you are, have bought a deal from. Now, you're going to say, well, how do I get my seller to do this? What you do is right at the closing table. You say, you know, look, um, Mr. Smith, ha have we had a good experience? You know, have I done everything I said I was going to do? Yeah, no problem. Can you take just a minute and can you write me a little note, you know, so I can put that in, in my book? And you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, can you do it for me and I'll sign it? So here's your opportunity to toot your horn. Okay? So, that, and it's very simple. You get these right at the closing table. Before and after photographs of properties that you have done. Folks, if you haven't done your first deal yet or you haven't done very many deals yet, can I give you a little piece of advice? 
Start a photo album and take before and after photographs of every property that you're doing. Or if you're wholesaling them, picture of the property, copy of the check. Let me tell you that nine years or ten years down the road, like it's been for me, it's priceless. It is such a trip. One, you're going to use it for your credibility kit. But number two, it is such a trip. And I know Robin would agree with me because she's done hundreds of homes. To go back to that video, oh, man, do you remember that one? You know, and stuff, and stuff like that. I mean, it, it's absolutely an incredible experience. And I know other gurus and other students out there who would have paid big money to be able to turn the clock back and to do that. So if you're not, if you haven't been taking before and afters, you really, really need to do that. Okay, so real important. So you're going to put before and after photographs um, of properties that you've rehabbed in this credibility kit. Once again, if you're wholesaling properties, you want to put a copy of, of a, a photograph of the property and a copy of the check underneath it in the credibility kit. The next thing we're going to put in there are personal reference letters. This is especially for those of you who haven't necessarily done your first deal yet or you haven't done many deals yet. You can get letters like from your boss if he or she still likes you. You can get letters from your, your pastor, your minister, you know, whatever that is for you. Um, any uh, service organizations that you belong to, like YMCA or anything like that, or Kiwanis or, you know, those kind of things, get letters from them. Any business owners that you know, you know, that, those types of folks. Okay, anybody who can give you a good personal reference letter, and we're going to be putting those in that credibility kit as well. Letters from vendors that you are working with. This is highly important. Um, your title agent or your attorney. If you're using a title agent, you also want a letter from your attorney in there. Your realtor, if you're working with a realtor in your business. Um, your surveyor. Um, anybody, your appraiser. Anybody who is crucial to getting a deal closed for you. Your private or hard money lenders, get letters from them and include it in this credibility kit. Any paid off notes or mortgages. So for example, somebody deeds you a property and then you sell it and now you have that paid off note. Just, you know, like black out the pertinent, you know, any social security numbers or anything like that that's in there. And then make a copy of that and put that in that credibility kit as well. Okay. All right, so these are all the items that are going into this credibility kit. Let me give you a recent example of a way that I used to steal properties from another, uh, many other investors. This is recent. And then I'll tell you how to do it overall. I was driving down the road one day, down in Bradenton, and there was a house. And there was a big sign on the lawn, and it said, for sale, needs to be sold today, and the paint is dripping. So, and there's all these cars parked everywhere. So I went, ah! pulled in. So I'm walking around, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody in the room, because this is really the way it was. There are all these investors, and they got their little paint clip, you know, their little clipboards there, and they got their little pen there, and they're walking around the house, and they're making all these notes and everything like that. Well, if you have gotten any training from Robin, you already know that you can walk up to a house and say, that's a $20,000 rehab, that's a $30,000 rehab. You don't need 27 pages of notes. So there's all these investors, and they got their little clipboards, and they walk out of the house. And same thing inside. So I did a quick run around the outside of the house, did a quick run on the inside of the house, got on the phone, called my appraiser really quick. Um, and this could be like, you know, your appraiser, your realtor, whoever you can get a hold of like now. And it happened to be my appraiser that day. And I called him on the phone and I said, hey, Jerry, I need to know the value on this house really fast. Get it, I need comps now. Address is yada, yada, yada. Terrible condition, house is a mess. Okay, I'll call you back in a minute. About 10 minutes later, Jerry calls me back and got my comps. So I'm doing my calculations. It takes me just a minute to do that. Did my calculations, figured out how much to offer for the property. And so the seller is sitting on this, um, like, lawn chair under the carport. He's just like, and so I walked up to the seller and I said, okay, I'm prepared to make you an offer right now. I'd like to offer you $55,000 on your property. I need to close by Monday. It's like Wednesday of the previous week. No problem. I can close by Monday. That's easy stuff. 
What makes you think you can close any better than any of the rest of these idiots? My his words, not mine. Well, sir, um, hold on one second. I'll be right back. So I walk back to my car because my credibility kit is always in the car. Okay, I have more than one copy of it, so it's in the car. Here you go, sir. Here's everything that you need. There you go. You call anybody on that list you want to call. You call anybody in there. He picks up his telephone and he starts calling. He calls the appraiser. He calls the title person. He calls my realtor. He calls my hard money lenders. Five phone calls later, he's like, "Okay, that's fine. Get a contract." Contract's right here, sir. We write out the contract. We're done. I want $5,000 deposit today. I don't make deposits on properties. I'm like, oh, crummo. So I call my private lender. I said, what are we going to do? I said, okay, sir, hold on one second. So I call my private lender. I'm like, okay, what are we going to do here? He goes, no problem. He goes, you got a credit card, right? Yeah. Put a check on your credit card or go to the title company and let them, you know, run it for you for the $5,000 down. And I'll give it back to you at the closing. Big whoop. I'm like, God, you're so smart. Okay, we're all set. It's your responsibility to get rid of all those idiots. <laughs> no problem. Can't you know this is for real? There's like 15 investors. Um, I just bought the place. I, I just bought this house. Go. I just bought this house. You're on my property. Leave. 15 times. And they're all furious with me. How'd you do that? I know what I'm doing, okay? Seriously, guys, this is the way you use a credibility kit to steal properties from other investors. Now, here's another really neat way to use this tool. You're going out to see a seller, right? And you've got your credibility kit. Now, a credibility kit is a really good thing to hand to a seller to keep them busy so you can look at the house without somebody like right here. Okay, so well, that's another really great way to use this tool. So you've got them looking at your credibility kit. And you come back and you say, okay, I'd like to make an offer on your property. My offer is whatever it is. Okay. Well, I want to talk to a couple of other investors before I make a final decision. Have you ever had that happen to you? Yes, absolutely. I totally understand that. But can I give you a little piece of advice? Would that be okay? Yes. When the next investor comes out, they should have a book. It looks just like this. This is called a business plan or a credibility kit. If they don't have a book that looks very similar to this, either they haven't been in the business very long or they might be trying to scam you, you might want to be really careful about who you're dealing with. You are protecting your sellers, folks, by doing this. Okay? Next seller, next investor comes out, I'd like to make you an offer on your property. Okay? Can I see your credibility kit? Because I'd really like to know whether or not you can close. Mine, what? Folks, I kid you not, this is a great way for you to gain credibility with your sellers and steal properties from your, uh, from your competitors over and over. You heard me ask how many folks had letters from other sellers and not a single person in this room raised their hand. Do you think if you had your credibility kit in hand right now and went out to do the same deal that these folks did, you'd get it instead? Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Credibility in kit is absolutely the way to go. So real, real important. Now, almost forgot. This one. Who needs some information about, okay, that's the first hand up right there, about building a credibility kit? <laughs> you, because you're such an awesome sport. Right here? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so next. Now, I know that you're asking, but Kathy, do I have to do all the work? Absolutely not. What we're going to teach you to do is how to automate the system and get it into somebody else's hands so you don't have to do the work. All you got to do is deal with the sellers, and then you can do whatever else you want to do. So let's talk about marketing on autopilot. You select your target list. Based on whatever direct mail campaign you want to do, so you're going to give the list broker the list of the parameters the way I gave them to you. If you're working with one of my list brokers, they already have it. Number two, you're going to find a part-time person who's going to stamp them, copy them, address them, stuff them, the whole nine yards. Okay? Now, it's very easy for you to find this person. It could be an older child, stay-at-home mom, an older person, High school student, college student, very easy to find the person to do this work for you. 
Number three, you're going to hand them my system. It will train them for you. All you have to do is go to the direct mail campaign you want to do, take that section out, hand it to the person, and let them read the directions and do the work. Number four, you are going to mail the letters. This is the last check that you have to make sure that the work got done. So before the person gets paid, they are going to bring the completed work back to you. Does that make sense? Yes? This also gives you the opportunity to start tracking your results because you know exactly what date they went to the post office. Now, does that look pretty incredibly simple? Yes? What if I could make it simpler for you? Yes? Because I can. I have created a relationship with a company who will do all of the work for you. All you have to do is to provide them with the letter and the list, and they will do everything else for you. So what you do is you use your software system. You have the list broker download the, um, the list that you're going to use into your software system. You may merge the letters that are already in there, and you drop the whole list to the company that's going to do all the work for you. Click, click, click. Done. Cool? Yes? I like it. All right. I mean, we can't make it any simpler than that. I absolutely believe in the credo. The less I do, the more I make. The sooner you get the minutia out of your lives, the more quickly you're going to start making some serious money in this business. Would you like to see what my results look like for the entire year last year? Yes? Okay. I mailed out about 12,000 letters, just about 1,000 letters per month. For those of you who have heard me speak before, you will see that numbers dropped a little bit. We used to do more. But what's happening is we're getting such a response rate from our mailings that we lowered what we're doing okay, in order to be able to handle the response rate. See, that's the thing. You have such control. You can do whatever you want to do. You can gauge it up, gauge it back. Oh, I'm going on vacation for three weeks. You can dial it back a little bit. You are in total and complete control at all times with what's happening with your real estate investing business. Once again, please do not let my numbers scare you. You can start with 100 letters a month, 50 letters a month, 200 letters a month, just like you saw in those other letters, and you will get a tremendous response. We got 807 leads, about 75 leads per month. How many folks in the room would like to get 75 leads per month from highly qualified, motivated sellers? Be careful what you wish for. We bought 50 of those properties. I will tell you, I'm getting lazy. Last year was a little year for us because we're starting to spend more time doing other stuff, okay? I have three grandchildren now. I'd rather spend my time with them. Um, so once again, you're totally in control. You can do 100 deals, 75 deals, 50 deals, 30 deals, 10 deals, whatever fits in your personal comfort zone. For me, last year it was 50. That worked. Total cash, 939000 Total equity, $1,609,000. Total cash and equity, $2,548,000. Total cost of mailings and negligible, $9,000. Net profit, $2,538,000. Is that okay for you guys? Yes? Okay. That's what I said. 50 letters was, I mean, 50 deals was plenty. <laughs> All right. So how many folks in the room feel like you might, oh, I'm sorry, let me just set, finish this up. What that also means is that overall we got about a 7% response rate. Oh, yeah, overall, is that okay? Now, the other thing is my degree is in accounting, and I just can't help myself. I just love numbers. I just do. And so what that also means is that for every single letter that left my office, I made $211, Okay. 69 cents to mail, 211. Does that work? Okay. Thought it was kind of neat. <laughs> All right. So how many folks feel like you might be able to do a few extra deals in the next 12 months using my marketing system? Anybody? All right. So let's take a peek and see what all is in there. Now I get to come up here. Okay. The first thing that is in there are all 12 of the direct mail campaigns, and they are in two manuals that look just like this. Now, don't let the size of the manuals scare you either, because as I said before, what we've done is this is basically 
a training tool. So all of the directions that you need for each one of the direct mail campaigns that you want to do are in there. So those two manuals look like just like that, and I'm moving the water before I take it out. Okay. So if you've seen me before, no, I'm lethal. <laughs> it can be. There are complete directions to automate the system and put it into somebody else's hands, no matter what point you're at in the real estate investing business, whether you're just now getting started or whether you've been in the business for a while and you want to beef up what you're already doing. We've included all of the letters, all the response forms for the sellers and the list of brokers. It's all in there for you. What I've also done is the letters are also on a CD-ROM. All you have to do is pop it into your system, make the changes, and you can mail them out. Or they're already in your software system that you're going to get with this. So all you do is just change, you know, add your name and phone number and all that good stuff, and you're ready to roll. The next thing in there is complete directions for calling on ads, scripts, who to call, and a system to get somebody else doing all the work for you. Now, we didn't talk about that, so let's take a minute to do that. I told you how I hated calling on classified ads, right? But sometimes there are deals there to be made, are there not? Yes? So what I did was I created a system, and what I do is I have a series of telephone scripts in there. And I have one person who on Sunday night between 5 and 9 p.m., because in testing we found that that's the, hot, the time when the most people are home, and she calls each one of those ads in the classified ads in the newspaper and in the shopper guide for sale by owner and for rent by owner. Because some of those are people that are trying, they'd really like to sell it, but they can't, so they're going to rent it instead. Okay, so she calls on both of those. She fills out a telephone script for each one of those folks, and on Monday morning, she faxes them over to my office. Now, she's been doing it for a while, so she's really good, and she writes little notes. Waste of time. Call this guy now! Okay? So once you get somebody who kind of knows what they're doing, they're going to kind of pre-screen them for you, whether you want them to or not. And you can go through and decide which sellers you want to contact. Now, if you haven't done many deals yet, this is a really good way for you to get some leads in a really non-threatening way. And if you've been in the business for a while, here's another way for you to beef up what you're already doing. That doesn't work that far away. Okay, either way. There are 24 additional marketing techniques and samples of all of them, and we'll go over those in just a little bit. There's an eight audio CD set and the tracking charts to go with it. So in each manual, there are four CDs. And you want to start listening to those first. They were professionally done in the studio. They're triple tracked for your car. And I will tell you that we almost never get anybody who, who um, takes advantage of this. But in Marketing Magic 2, when we put that manual together, we started talking about some deals and so forth that we had done. And after every deal that we do, there's a chit-ching, like a cash register ding in there. And if you listen to the CDs and you count all of those cash register dings, and you email me and you let me know how many there were, we're going to see an additional bonus that's valued at $149 absolutely for it. In the last six months, I think I've had two. <laughs> okay? So I'm just letting you know it's there. Because I want you to listen to them. All right, so there's another manual in there called Kathy Kennebrook's Seller Phone Conversations. And that's this manual right here. And basically, this manual, what we ended up doing was we went back and we had um, students who were contacting us. And they were saying, you know, Kathy, I haven't done very many deals yet. And, gee, I, I just don't know what, what a you know, conversation with a motivated seller should sound like. You know, what do I do? So what we did was we went back through our files for all 12 direct mail campaigns, and we pulled real deals with real sellers, both motivated and non-motivated, for each of the direct mail campaigns. We went back into the studios. We recreated those conversations for you so you can listen to them or you can read them depending on how you absorb information the best. If you haven't done very many deals yet, excellent training tool for you. For those of you who have been in the business for a while, here's the training tool that you're going to use to train the people who are going to be talking on the phone for you. Okay, does that kind of make sense? 
Actually, okay, let's see. That'll be all right. All right. So that's those. It's getting crowded up here. Okay. All right. The next thing that I'm also going to include for you is our real...